Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. I'm Michael Kendrick and been asked to introduce our guest speaker for the state of the art lecture. As surgeons, we're a unique group of individuals who are at high risk of developing work related musculoskeletal symptoms. These symptoms are a common issue affecting between 70 and 90% of us. Up to 90% of surgeons performing minimally invasive surgical procedures experience pain or discomfort, and 10 to 35% have at some point needed to limit their surgical practice. Nearly all surgical specialties and age groups report symptoms. Surgical trainees are also affected with as much as 90% reporting symptoms. While the ergonomics of robotic, laparoscopic, and open surgery are very different, none of these groups are spared. As a 20-year veteran of minimally invasive approaches for HPB surgery, and as a post-recipient of post of hours of physical therapy, injections, and even back operations, not only am I interested in this topic, but the staggering prevalence of surgeons affected, the complexity and long hours of the procedures in our specialty, I would suggest that this should be of interest for all of us. With that said, it's a great pleasure to introduce our invited lecturer, Dr. Peter Rosenblatt, to pre present the state-of-the-art lecture my back hurts, ergonomics, and surgery. Dr. Rosenblatt completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology at University of Massachusetts Medical School and a fellowship in urogynecology and pelvic reconstructive surgery at Brown. He is an assistant professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School. Since 1995, he served as a director of the urogynecology and reconstructive pelvic surgery at Mount Auburn Hospital in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He has an active clinical practice and specializes in laparoscopic reconstructive pelvic surgery and minimally invasive treatments for pelvic organ prolapse, as well as urinary and fecal incontinence. He is the immediate past president of the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons and has served on the board of directors of the American Urogynecologic Society. He's invented and licensed technology to several medical device companies and holds 17 patents in the field of urogynecology and general surgery. Like the vast majority of us, Dr. Rosenblatt was never formally taught about ergonomics in his surgical training or even the early part of his career. He's developed an, a personal interest in this subject, and it's a pleasure to hear from him today, Dr. Rosenblatt. I assume this is on now. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that introduction, and, and I'd like to thank Dr. Maker for uh, inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure, and it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, I do want to talk about, you know, I, I sat in the last couple panel discussions. We talk a totally different language. It's really amazing. But we do share this. We are all surgeons, just like Mike said. Whether you do open surgery or you do vaginal surgery like we do or laparoscopic or robotic surgery, we all are in the same boat. We all have the same risks. And that's what we're going to talk about because, as Mike said, we don't have much training or any training. In, in, uh, in ergonomics of, of surgery. There's been a, quite a bit of research and literature in this, but most of the research actually kind of treated all healthcare professionals in sort of a heterogeneous fashion, including nurses, like how to lift patients, how to transfer patients. And only in the last couple of years have different surgical subspecialties looked at this in terms of you know, general surgeons, uh, ophthalmic surgeons, uh, uh, and, and now gynecologic surgeons. That's where I want to uh, concentrate. Um, these are my disclosures. I do work with a lot of medical health care companies on, on a lot of devices. Um, none of these have anything to do. They're not relevant to the discussion today. I guess my only disclosure is that I'm not a uh, engineer. Uh, I'm not a physical therapist. I do a tremendous amount of straight stick laparoscopic surgery. And, and I've got low back pain as well. I haven't had the surgery that Mike Kendrick had, uh, but, um, but I feel like you know, things that I'm doing now can probably avoid that, and that's what I want to share with you today. So I want to take you back to 2004, so that's 17 years ago. I was on a bus with about 12 other gynecologic surgeons. We were coming back from an industry-sponsored surgical event. We were heading back to the airport, and one of my colleagues who's from uh, upstate Pennsylvania, had this scar. He was in his mid-40s at the time, and he had just had a laminectomy because of osteophytes, 
and spinal stenosis and a bulging disc. And he's very well known, a great medical uh, surgical educator. He does a tremendous amount of vaginal surgery, but he attributed this mostly to uh, laparoscopic surgery and awkward positions that he was facing. That's not so unique, you know, that some person on the bus had that, but one by one, about literally half the people on this bus said, I had that surgery too, either cervical spine surgery or lumbar surgery. And I was thinking to myself, this is crazy. That is not normal, that that many people would have surgery. The other interesting thing about this group of surgeons is that most of them were academics. Most of them were from major medical centers. And why is that important? That's important because those of us in the room uh, who do uh, teach fellows and residents, and here, here I am doing vaginal surgery with, with, a, uh, with a resident, um, we're used to, we're being actually relegated to assisting more than we are doing the actual surgery ourselves, right? Now, if you remember back in medical school when you were doing your OBGYN rotation and you had that kind of awkward leaning in with the retractors or holding Alice's, the Bryski Navratol retractors or Devers, it's exhausting. And it really takes a toll on your shoulders and upper back. And there's even a study that shows that assistance to vaginal surgery have a lot more shoulder and back discomfort than the primary surgeons. By the way, she's sitting down. We usually stand up, but even if you're standing up, you're still leaning into one side or the other. The right thing to do there, by the way, is to switch sides from time to time. It's the static postures that really lead to injuries. So whether you do open surgery or you do laparoscopic straight stick traditional surgery or robotic surgery, these kind of problems can affect all of us. So here, here's one of the studies that was done on general surgeons. This was a study on over 300 uh, respondents of general surgeons who had laparoscopic uh, uh, practices. And what it showed is that, the as Mike said, the majority of respondents, now definitely there's some selection and re, you know, a, a subjective bias in this, right? Because you're more likely to respond to a questionnaire or a survey if you have that problem. We know that. But 87% of respondents reported that they had significant physical discomfort. Interestingly, and actually it kind of makes sense, the strongest predictor of those symptoms was the large caseload. So who had the largest caseload? It was the people in training. It was the residents. It was the fellows who are constantly in the OR, more so than age, height of the surgeon, or years in practice. I think that's pretty interesting. And the, the last thing is there was a very poor awareness of ergonomic principles. How many people here, raise your hand if you've been trained in ergonomic principles in your residency or fellowship? I know I wasn't. And they asked this, Park asked this. They said, all right, have you received any formal training or are you aware of ergonomic principles? 58% of the respondents said they were either slightly aware or not aware at all of ergonomic principles. A very small percent, I think it was about 10%, had felt like they were very aware of ergonomic principles. And this is what we do for a living. So we decided to do this in our, in our uh, society. So we did a, a prospective cross-sectional web-based uh, uh, survey uh, of a lot of uh, surgeons in our field of reconstructive pelvic surgery and laparoscopy. And we got nearly uh, 500, it was 495 respondents. The majority of respondents had significant pain in lower back, neck, shoulder, upper back, and even wrist and hand pain. So this is very, very prevalent. We also found that most of the respondents felt that the surgery either exacerbated or was the original cause of their discomfort. And in our case, we found that women had twice the risk of men, lower back pain, upper back pain, and wrist. Now that's really important in OBGYN especially because the majority of OBGYN residents now are women. So it's becoming a much more a female dominated specialty and women are certainly at risk, and there could be a number of reasons for that that we'll discuss. I'm sure you've all seen this, right? There are so many graphics that show 
the best ergonomic practices for the computer workstation, right? OSHA is like all over this, right? OSHA has all of this. They talk about the position of your body, of your neck, of the monitor, of your elbows, of your wrists, et cetera, and when to take breaks, et cetera. Well, let's look at laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery, and I'm gonna talk mostly about straight stick, but it, 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 it uh, applies to other types of surgery as well. But laparoscopic surgery, we're working off a monitor. We have our hands in a position, which can be either ergonomic or non-ergonomic. But we all know that you know laparoscopic surgery is so beneficial. It, was, it revolutionized how we do surgery, and I'm sure how all of you do surgery. Not just for, obviously, pain, but decreased perioperative morbidity and, and even cosmetics, right? But it takes a toll because we're dealing with fixed positions of trocars and very awkward motions for long periods of time. Now I can tell you when I started doing laparoscopic surgery back in the mid-1980s, this is how we did our laparoscopic surgery. Some of you might remember this. We didn't have cameras, right? We looked in, we leaned over and looked in. So why were we complaining about it back then? Well, the difference was we didn't do very much, right? I mean, we were looking in mostly for diagnostic laparoscopies, diagnosing adhesions, endometriosis, ovarian cysts, maybe an ectopic pregnancy. And if we saw something significant, very often back then, we opened. So we weren't spending a lot of time doing it. Now with my reconstructive pelvic surgeries that I do for prolapse, it's typically three to four to five hours. And I know in, in your field, it can be longer. So this is what we're gonna talk about. Uh, the, the five general areas of ergonomics, the OR setup, surgeon postures, either good or bad, ergonomic principles, instrument design, and perception, meaning the surgeon perception of, of pain and discomfort during surgery. So let's talk about OR setup. By the way, a lot of this is going to sound very, uh, pardon the expression, intuitive, but it isn't. And I can't believe how often you see really bad ergonomics in the OR. So surgeon and monitor position, we'll talk about table and surgeon height, the position of foot pedals, and instrument access. So I actually took this picture last week. This is our hepatobiliary surgeon at Mount Auburn Hospital. Uh, Aram Demersion, who's not here this week, unfortunately, but I came in to watch him do a distal uh, pancreatectomy, and he had a very nice position here. He had a good position of the monitors. He's across the bed. His assistant, I think her monitor is up too high. We'll talk about this, uh, but, but this is, these are the things we have to think about. Look at this. This, this is craziness, isn't it? The, the camera needs to be facing toward the monitor. Here, the camera is facing away from the monitor, and the surgeon is twisting his head around to look at the monitor. This doesn't make sense. And, and I saw this recently in a case, it was some colorectal surgeon. They're often used to working up in the upper abdomen, so they keep their monitors near anesthesia, near the head of the bed, but they were doing a rectopexy down in the pelvis, but they kept the monitors up near the head of the bed. That makes no sense. So there's a general principle uh, called the straight line principle where you get everything as best you can in a straight line, the surgeon, the scope, the target organ, and the monitor. And this is what it would look like, I assume, uh, for maybe a lap coli or, or some of the other kind of procedures you do. Although this patient is in lithotomy position, and I notice when I, I watch uh, Aram do his surgery that the patients are often just supine with the legs together. Uh, but here you have the surgeon uh, with the camera, the laparoscope, the trocar, the target, and the monitor all in the straight line. It makes total sense, but it's amazing how often you don't see that. You'll notice something in this picture. I pulled this off the internet. Uh, this is how we did surgery until maybe, what, 15 years ago, where the big you know, CRT monitors, I don't think you can find them anymore, right? Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, maybe in some closet somewhere, but they were always sitting on the top of the tower. They had to be, they were so huge. And so you can see this person's line of sight is looking up, up to the top of the tower. Uh, this puts a lot of strain on your cervical spine and possibly your upper back and causes fatigue. So, I mean, this is another picture I pulled off the internet. These people are looking st like straight up. And for a long case, this, is, this has a real significant mechanical disadvantage 
to your posture and to your cervical spine. So besides the straight line principle, let's look back at that, those guidelines that OSHA has for computer monitor uh, monitors. And really, the top of the monitor should be at your eye level. And then the bottom of the monitor could be somewhere between 25 and 35 degrees down. Now, thank goodness that most of the monitors now are flat screen TVs and that they are on adjustable booms. So you can lower them down uh, so that you're in that uh, uh, situation. Now, in terms of the surgeon height, this surgeon um, is obviously too low. Uh, so he has a real mechanical disadvantage. And not just the table, by the way. You also have to consider the size of the patient. Right? An obese patient's going to add height. So you need to be even higher. And this type of elbow flexion of less than 90 degrees sets up a real mechanical disadvantage and either supination or pronation of the wrist that causes fatigue there too. This will also lead to kind of the chicken wing appearance where you're off operating like this, which may be okay for a short period of time, but this causes shoulder elevation and fatigue and possible injury to the shoulders as well. If you think about it, we are one of the only professions as surgeons where we are dependent on more than one person when you think about ergonomics. And we've all been in that experience where you're dealing with a very tall surgeon and a very short surgeon in the same case. In general, you should adjust the patient to the tallest surgeon in the room. That's never me, by the way and then make adjustments for the shorter people in the room. So adjust it to the tallest patient in the room. And the, you know, there, there's something about the use of steps or platforms like shown here at the bottom, that yellow platform. It, it's somehow seen as like a crutch or a you know, weakness. It's not a crutch, it's not a weak, weakness. It just means that the OR tables aren't made to go low enough or maybe you're just too short. It is not a sign of, of weakness. So get up uh, on one or two platforms uh, to get yourself in the best mechanical position. This is a video that we made several years ago to show you that's the best angle, right? This is a physical therapist who made this video with me. And it shows that the best ergonomics is when the elbow flexion is somewhere between 90 and 110, de 110 degrees. That's the best, now that isn't always the case, but if you can get it that way for the majority of the case, you won't have weakness there. What about foot pedals? Sometimes we're at the mercy of our circulating nurses putting down the foot pedal where they want to put it down. And if you see the person on the left, she's got her foot pedal, so she has to cross her legs over and twist in order to see the monitor. So you really should have the foot pedal in line with the monitor, and that, that's the best ergonomic position for a foot pedal. So if it's not that way, and by the way, most surgeons don't like foot pedals. We're moving more toward having the activation on the instrument itself. It can confuse you. You may step on monopolar when you want a bipolar, or you may step on the wrong instrument pedal. So that's why we're getting away in general from foot pedals as much as possible, like the Ligashore, one of those devices, something like that. Instrument access, this is real nice, by the way, is, is we, we have these things you'll see in yellow, the saddlebags that gynecologists use. I don't know if anyone here uses saddlebags, but they're really useful because you can put all your common instruments right near you within of easy reach, and you're not turning around to a Mayo stand, and you're not depending on your circulating nurse. So having saddlebags and instrument access prevents that twisting and turning. Now we're going to talk about surgeon posture. This is one of the most common errors that people make. It's called forward head posture. And it's very detrimental, leaning forward. This is one of my favorite pictures that I took of my fellow Sally doing surgery. And I'm going to borrow this gavel to show you. I think this is the funniest thing. What is she doing, right? She's, she's trying to get closer to the image by, by, by putting her head forward. And I say to her, Sally, you know, instead of doing this, you could just do this. You know, you could just move the laparoscope closer. And so, but it's something we, we get when we're very intense, we're thinking a lot, and we just want to get closer. Also, fortunately, by the way, uh, we're moving from 1080p monitors to the 4K. We just got 4K at our hospital, 
which is four times the pixel resolution of the 1080p's. So if you can get, it makes a huge difference. You don't feel like you have to lean over to see the image as much. So image quality, I think, is going to improve this. Uh, does anyone remember where this is from? Anyone? Jerry Maguire, that's right. Jerry Maguire, where, he's, where Jonathan Lipinski says, Jerry, did you know that the human head weighs eight pounds? Just totally random. It actually, maybe his head was eight pounds. It's more like 10 pounds. But anyway, it's true that every inch you move forward, you put an extra 10 pounds of weight on the cervical spine. So if you see, you know, three inches forward is like 30 to 40 pounds, you know, depending on the weight of, the, of that person's head. So it's really damaging. That can cause uh, uh, osteophyte development. That can cause arthritis. That can cause a bulging disc. And it certainly caused a lot of neck strain in people. Now, this is not unique, obviously, to laparoscopic straight stick surgery. You know, Google open surgery or surgeon, and you'll see a million pictures like this, a million. This is what surgeons do all the time, and we don't think about it because we're not trained to do this. Here's another common postural mistake that people make, which is elevated shoulders. Now, the reason for this, this particular case, this is off the internet, is the person is too low compared to the patient. They should be up much higher, so their arms are low. But if you have to raise your arms, you have shoulder elevation. This is from the video. You can see that you know, possibly it's the intensity of surgery. It's being a little anxious during surgery, and you lift your shoulders up. That causes a lot of stress and a lot of fatigue of those muscles and ca can cause long-term injuries. Awkward positions. You know, laparoscopic surgery is great, but the problem is that we have fixed port sites and long instruments. With open surgery, we have very small instruments. We have lots of degrees of freedom of our wrists. When you have laparoscopic surgery, the number of degrees of freedom is reduced, and so we're at a real mechanical disadvantage, especially if you have to lean over the patient like this doctor's doing. I can see if you're alone in practice, you don't have qualified residents and fellows and assistants to help you. This is where I think robotic surgery can be very useful, right? Because you don't have to lean way over. I get that. Uh, I personally don't do robotic surgery anymore uh, for a number of reasons. I used to. Uh, but there's a real mechanical disadvantage if you have to lean over. Very awkward position, and you can see the supination or pronation of the wrist is, is going to cause wrist pain. By the way, robotic surgeons are not immune to bad posture. You know, you can see on the left side of the screen, she's resting her arms nicely. How many times have you seen or if you, you see the, the surgeon without repositioning their hands, they start elevating their shoulders so they're up like this. That, that is not uh, ergonomic at all. So you have to you know, reposition by clutching, bringing your shoulders, uh, your wrist down so that you're uh, on the armrest itself. Now we're talking about what's called the lower quadrants. This is where I'm very guilty and, uh, of, and it's called asymmetric loading or shifting your weight from one side to another, where we want to be more neutral, which can include, by the way, using a step. That is perfectly allowed, allowable as long as you're not shifting your weight. Let me show you our uh, physical therapist model in our, in our uh, video. Um, she's going to show that is asymmetric loading, and that can cause lower back pain. And we do that all the time. We get antsy, and we'll change to the other side. All right? What you want to do is to evenly distribute the weight in the midline. And you can even turn to the side a little bit, which you'll do here. But you're staying even as well. Now, she's also going to demonstrate using a step. She's going to bring a step around. And it's perfectly acceptable, as long as you keep your weight in the middle, to stay like that. But watch what can happen if you start to slouch. You get a posterior tilt, and that creates um, a stress on the lower back. All right, we'll talk, I'm just going to talk for a minute about uh, instruments. Obviously, you know, surgeons, not just different height, but different hand sizes. And especially in our field, in gynecology, a lot more women. But in general, um, uh, instruments are designed, in general, for men. And I know over the last couple of years, there's been more emphasis to try to 
develop instruments that can, uh, are appropriate for all types of surgeons, but they still aren't. They're not specifically designed for laparoscopic use, the handles. They don't take into account different hand sizes and body sizes, and it causes excess supination and pronation. I'm going to show you an example of what I was using. This is a, a typical uh, monopolar scissors that I'm using, and it's very comfortable. But we in gynecology often use a suprapubic trocar as well. Now, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be holding it like that or like that. But either way, it's not ergonomic. This is why we need to work with industry to design better handles, because they don't see what we do in surgery. They should. They should be coming in, and some do, come into the operating room. But we need to work with them on designing better handles, because that's awkward, even though it's a, a, a normal laparoscopic instrument. And lastly, perceptions. Perceptions are a problem. We are told that the patient comes first. The patient does come first, but we do have to think about ourselves. Pain is generally seen as part of the job by surgeons. Of 40% of general surgeons who responded that they had significant musculoskeletal problems said that what would they do if they had pain? They would just bear it. They would just power through. That's a mistake. Barack Obama said this, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. So we need to take the bull by the horn. We need to lead the way in making the changes. I don't know if you know Atul Gawande. He's a general and endocrine surgeon in, in, in Boston, where I am, but he's at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I don't know if anyone's read his books. Complications was great. The Checklist Manifesto is amazing. And then he wrote a book that I haven't read yet called Being Mortal. I'm dying to read that book, no pun intended. Uh, but he also wrote for The New Yorker. And, uh, and he wrote this great article about, uh, yeah, 10 years ago now, about surgical coaching. And what Atul Gawande says is, you know, you look at professional golfers or professional tennis players, they all have coaches. We get trained. We might do a residency, we might do a fellowship, and we're let loose, and we don't have coaches. Now, that applies to a lot of things, you know, techniques, how to handle complications, et cetera. But I, I decided to do that for me, for, for ergonomics. So I invited a physical therapist into my OR, and I, she didn't say anything during the case at all. She just took notes. She was watching me, she was watching my fellow. And then we sat down and we debriefed. And we talked about what, we, what she thought. And it was amazing, actually. Uh, and it's something that I actually, it was like an epiphany for me. And that was, that was about 10 years ago as well. This is something I think about on a daily basis when I'm doing surgery. I was doing so much wrong. I was doing forward head posture. I was elevating my shoulders. I was doing asymmetric loading. And that one intervention has made a huge difference. So how do we manage this? Well, I would say, first of all, consider you. Consider making changes to your OR. You know, look at these ergonomic principles in terms of the location of the monitor, in terms of the height of the monitor. Can you make adjustments? You know, can, will you get a step to stand up higher? Just try it. It's actually enlightening when you're on a step. Uh, I'm 5'8", you know, and I'm on a step on every case, and it's so much more comfortable, and I have so much less shoulder and back pain. So look at the changes in your OR. We should all be exercising. We should all be doing aerobics a couple times a week. We should be lifting weights several times a week. I thought I was in pretty good shape until I went running on the beach on that today. I was exhausted after, I, I think it's the, I'm blaming it on the humidity and the heat but I thought I was gonna die, by the way. Um, but we really need to work out more, we need to stretch more. Do the planks, do sit-ups, core, a lot of that. When you're in surgery and you notice, like I will, point, I will call out my fellow or my resident if I see them doing the forward head posture. And the postural reset is called a chin tuck, is to bring it back. So actually do that, bring it back, chin tuck. Um, the shoulder elevation, postural reset is just to simply, okay, you feel tense, just lower your shoulders like that. 
there's been a lot of talk about micro breaks. They talk about it in the computer workstations. Every 20 to 30 minutes, take one minute, take a break, do some stretching. We have plenty of time to do that. How many times do you say you asked for something and the circulating nurse has to run out to get a trocar or an instrument, a suture? Take that time, step back, and I'm gonna show you a, a typical uh, micro break. This is one of my fellows. She's looking up to the ceiling. She's looking down. She'll look to the right. This takes less than a minute. Look to the left. Look up and stretch and stick your belly out. Stretch that back. Lean forward with a straight back. Then do the shoulders. Lift your shoulders up. Bring your scapulas back and bring them down. Lastly, interlace your fingers and push straight out. If we did this, and you can do this several times, there's also lower extremity uh, uh, micro breaks as well that have been described. Uh, and if you did this a couple times during a long case, you'd feel a lot better. So micro breaks are very important. We have this uh, institution right down the street from where I work. I'm in, right in Harvard Square, and right down the street is this institution called Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I'm amazed how little I've worked with them, but I have worked with them. And I've worked with a couple of their engineers and professors on, on a couple different devices. This was a very nice device, a body support device. It had two modules, an upper module that hooked up to the rails of the OR table, and it, was, uh, it had a spring mechanism. You could lean against it, and it also had fixed armrests that swung out. So you could use it to hold your laparoscope, and you could use it for another instrument. It also had a platform that had springs in it. It made it actually very comfortable. I don't think this has made it to the market. Um, the other things that are interesting and people are looking at right now are um, all of a sudden it's not advancing. Ah, did you do that or I do that? You? OK. I don't know. You might have to do it. These are, these are exoskeletons. And uh, exoskeleton, this one actually, I thought it worked on hydraulics. It just works on springs. And the exoskeletons were developed originally for people working on cars and boats uh, because they're working up here. And it's been adapted for uh, surgeons as well in Europe. It is very expensive. It's somewhere between four and six thousand dollars. I just don't see my hospital buying that for me, but I think it's a, re a really good idea. And uh, I guess that you need to advance again. Uh, at first, this looks totally ridiculous. This was, it's called the Ethos Chair. It was developed by a urologic surgeon primarily to do radical prostatectomy. So if you look at the left side, that's the model showing you're basically sitting over the patient's head, right? I thought anesthesia would like, there's no way. But they were okay with it. You know, it's not going to collapse. Um, and it puts you right in the center so that your arms are a mechanical advantage. You know, it, it holds the scope for you, you can adjust it, but it, it, you, know, you, you rest up against the, uh, the chest rest and it works. Our hospital, we were given the opportunity to have this uh, for six months and try it out. They wouldn't take it primarily because it takes up a lot of real estate and no one knew where to store it. But I think it's a really good idea uh, so it's mostly used for pelvic surgery. I assume it could be adapted for upper abdominal surgery as well. Next. And I did try this out. I tried it with some interesting wristed instruments uh, that was being developed uh, uh, in a, a company called Cambridge Endo in Framingham, Massachusetts, that kind of uh, imitated uh, uh, the robot in terms of the movements. And I found this very, very interesting, very comfortable. Uh, fortunately, let's go to the next. This is the last slide, but there are a couple builds, so I'll just tell you when to advance it. So just to conclude, this is my last slide, um, we need to be thinking about the ergonomics in the OR. You know, I think you, you've now learned about primarily the most important things that we talk about. Next. Um, think about the monitor position and height of the monitors. Next. Uh, the surgeon height relative to the patient. And when you see like, some of the best surgeons in the world doing laparoscopic surgery, at least in our field, they're much higher than the patient. They're on multiple steps, 
and with a very good uh, 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 position of their arms. Next. Um, be aware of your awkward positions, leaning over, uh, using a forward head posture or shoulder elevation, and uh, be aware of that and try to reduce the number of times that happens. Consider enlisting a coach. And, and a physical therapist, I think, would be the best. If you, can, if you can get a physical therapist to come in and just observe you, because again, that one intervention made a huge difference in, in my uh, posture, and I think about it on a, on a daily basis. And lastly, um, remember postural resets. Take the time when a circulating nurse goes out of the OR to take time to you know, stretch and do the postural resets. I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have a little bit of time if we want to answer any questions people may have. Thank you. This, I'm, I'm from uh, BI, but we haven't oh, met. I'm Tarakand. Great. Uh, this was a great talk. Um, I was curious if in your, when you are uh, teaching, do you ad address these issues specifically per trainee based on like their size and whatnot? I mean, that, I find that to be a, a somewhat of a challenge. And I, I ask that because um, I, I'm always the short, almost always the shortest person, so I always am standing on stools, but a lot of the residents say, oh, that's so nice of you to do that, no one else does that. But I've seen tall men operating like standing in a practically a split to be shorter, so how do you suggest or how do you adapt that, particularly when the trainee may be, uh, uh, you know, maybe you're making recommendations that may come across as because of their uh, very tall or very short size, or maybe they're obese or whatnot. Thank you. Yeah, but by the way, and that, that's a real issue. The, the obesity issue is an issue with vaginal surgery, right? I mean, you know, fortunately, we've gotten away from, if you remember from, from uh, medical school, the candy cane stirrups, we've gotten away from them. You know, you've probably seen the GYNs now have, we have these Allen, Allen stirrups. Uh, which allow more space in between the legs, but you know if you have two or three large people, it can it can be a real problem. I mean, one thing you can do is you in vaginal surgery. Not, I know that doesn't isn't so apropos to what you guys do, but we'll have people over the top uh, of the patient, so they'll stand by the side of the patient, reaching over. That's more ergonomic, and definitely standing. Um, in terms of the size, you know, yes, we we do tell. They, and they're not going to change their size, right? They're, they're fully grown adults. So we t have to tell them, if you're the tallest person in the room, you really should insist on the patient, um, making the patient the right height for you, and everyone else should adjust, even if you're dealing with attendings. You know, if you're a resident, you're doing most of the case caseload, um, they should adjust for you. But I, I do make a point of saying, of calling out, I'm probably a pain in the neck, uh, but calling out, the fellows and the residents when I see forward head posture and shoulder elevation and kind of slouching, asymmetric loading. I think it's just important to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jing He from Baltimore. Uh, this is a phenomenal talk on ergonomics. Um, I'm uh, doing a lot of robotic surgery. Many robotic surgeons, they complain, you know, vision change. You know, do you have any research in that regard, you know? Um, vision protection, you know? I, I, I don't, uh, you know, and by the way, you can still have a significant, um, like, kyphosis when you're leaning over and forward head posture if you're not right up against the, uh, so th there can be really bad ergonomics. In terms of the vision, you know, I, I think the, my guess is, I haven't sat in the console in a couple years. Uh, we do have an SI, but, um, I would imagine the 4K is probably better resolution now than what they have in there. But I can tell you also, those open systems are coming out. I've seen some of them from some of the other competitors. And I think it'll be more like traditional laparoscopic surgery. So hopefully that'll, the competition will be good for Intuitive and for all of us and drive down the price. Yeah. Uh, and talk to our uh, society about this. Um, you know, when we look for experts to talk about this, there's not a lot of people that have done the work and done the data. 
and really have taken a deep dive into this, and he's really uh, certainly a, an expert in this field, and I have no doubt that your video will be watched uh, from our conference page by many, many more individuals. So we're very much indebted. Thank you greatly. And we have a, a plaque for you that reads, uh, 2021 State of the Art Lecture, Dr. Peter Rosenblatt from Miami. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks. Thank you.